welcome to what was the second live session of this year's West Cork History Festival. Um, as you may have read, uh, we have two interconnected themes this year, one of Ireland in 1921 and immediately afterwards, and the other aspects of Irish experience of empire. And for our next speaker, we're extremely fortunate uh, to have Mary Kenny, someone who is a writer and commentator, defies categorization in many ways. Uh, she's written books on a host of subjects, including uh, uh, Catholic Ireland's relationship to the British monarchy, but she also writes as surely very few uh, individuals do for journals as varied as the Irish Independent, uh, the Irish Catholic and the Oldie. Um, and so we're really delighted that she has agreed to come and speak on the subject of why the free state had to be a Catholic state and something of the character of that state uh, in its early years. As we probably don't need to say, this year the festival has had to be virtual, but uh, as they say, ubi est papa, ibi est Roma. And in this case, uh, Roma is in deal. Uh, so we're delighted and enormously grateful to Mary Kenny for joining us uh, by Zoom from Deal. And Mary, over to you. I often find in these uh, encounters that the comments at the end are more better informed than I am, actually. So uh, I, I really look forward to what everybody else has to say. Um, I'm probably the least distinguished of your contributors, really, because I'm not a professional historian. But I think what I there's one thing that I kind of can offer by way of perspective. And that is uh, a sort of very um, length old family background in the sense that my father was born in 1877, which is certainly a very long time ago. He was a young man in the 1890s. Uh, and of course, he was elderly when I was born in 1944. Uh, so I, I often feel I sort of have this arc of history across three centuries, you know, because my parents, my mother was born in 1902, and my parents met in the 1920s. And my father had been teaching in Chile in South America, and he actually came back to Ireland uh, in the early 1920s. Like a lot of Irish people at that time, uh, the di a diaspora, they were very excited about the prospect of a new state. Uh, and, and it did, I mean, it did sort of elicit a certain, certain amount of idealism. Uh, I remember Margaret McCurtain talking about that, that people wanted to build the state as well as they could. Um, but also, I, on a practical level, I think quite a lot of Irish Catholics thought there would be more job opportunities available to them, which uh, mightn't have been, uh, uh, you know, quite as open uh, during a, a British reg regime. So um, they, you know, they did have that optimism about the start of the Free State after this bitter civil war. And of course, the, 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 all that we've heard about the War of Independence. But not everybody... Um, uh, had the same optimism about the Free State. Uh, and, I mean, V.S. Pritchett, who visited Ireland in 1923, and he was in favour of, uh, of Irish independence, but he did find that the country was in absolute chaos. It was a shambles, really, uh, physically, materially. Um, he, <laughs> he, when he went to Limerick, by the way, he was asked not to lift his hat to a lady because he was told that Limerick is, is done with bourgeois manners. I, I wasn't aware that Limerick really specialised in bourgeois manners, but I thought that was a reflection of the little Soviets that they had in Limerick at the time. Now, C.S. Bretherton, who was a leading um, British journalist, of course, he was a correspondent for the Morning Post, which was a high Tory paper. He expressed doubt in 1924 that these bog trotters could ever run a country at all. He, he wrote, the good ship free state is already drifting towards the financial rocks. He said the Irishman's obsessions were limited to horse racing, religion, politics, and porter. Uh, 
and so Catholic faith hardly qualified as Christianity at all. So he had very uh, little um, confidence that Ireland would actually survive as, 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 as an independent country. Now, Ireland Usher, who was a very fair commentator, he was a supporter of the Free State and indeed of the Irish language. I mean, he wrote that the Southern Unionists, among whom he grew up, um, were pretty sceptical also whether the Irish could govern themselves. Uh, the old colonels, he wrote, regarded the Irish as knaves and scoundrels, hardly more fit than Hottentots to rule themselves. Um, and yet, writing in 1949, Usher's own judgment was that with the coming of the Free State, Ireland was governed by the most capable and disinterested group of young statesmen who ever midwived the birth of a nation. So he was very praising, really, of what had been accomplished. Uh, today, it's, it's fairly common, commonly expressed opinion that the Irish Free State was a Catholic state, even sometimes a theocracy. Um, in the words of Lorcan Sir, who's a, an architectural historian, he said, when the Brits moved out, the church moved in. Um, formerly, that wasn't quite the case. Before he died, Arthur Griffith had drafted a constitution in which the rights of minorities were to be respected and church and state to be kept separate. And so that was at least the aspiration. Um, I mean, one of the ways in which minorities, which was a code really for non-Catholics, were to be included in the new state was in the composition of the first Irish Senate. Um, among 30 members of the upper house, 17 fell into this category, according to Donald O'Sullivan's as a textbook on the Senate. This someone would describe this as tokenism um, or window dressing, or even a sort of sly way of keeping old money in the country. But I see this group as, as quite an admirable cast of characters who brought experience and personality um, and even a degree of colorfulness into the, new, into the new parliament. The chairman of the Senate was Lord Glenavy, who according to his son Paddy Campbell, who became something of a TV celebrity in the 1960s, was rather anti-Catholic actually, that he would deliver half in jest, great rolling denunciations based on the bottomless squalor of Roman Catholic superstition. And he'd do a hilarious, um, sort of comedy of Hail Marys in a Dublin accent as a party piece. But uh, nobody, seemed to, nobody seemed to object, and, and he served the state very well. I mean, he just had a, a centric sense of humour, uh, people thought. A considerable number of the new senators had seen their homes burned out by the, uh, by the ultra-Republicans or anti-treatyites. So John Keane was a Waterford landlord whose home, Belmont, had been burned down. In the Senate, he proved to be a strong opponent of some of the absurdities of literary censorship and even came to be seen as a sort of leading voice uh, of anti-censorship. Anti the 7th Earl of Mayo, Dermot Burke, who was a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, a novelist, a founder of the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland, and, and a very cultivated man, also saw his mansion, Palmerston, burned down, burned out. Sir Horace Plunkett, another senator who had done so much for Irish agriculture, suffered the same fate with Kiltira, his house in Fox Rock, which is now the site of an affluent housing estate. Another Southern Unionist senator was John Bagwell of Marlfield in County Tipperary, from of Harrow, Trinity, uh, 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 he, he went Harrow and Trinity, Oxford, but Marlfield too went up in flames, along with its priceless library. Jack B Bagwell had also been kidnapped at one point by the irregulars. Andrew Jemson, the whiskey magnate, and James Douglas, the Quaker, both of whom had been tentative go-betweens with warring sides during the Civil War, were well-known senators, as was Sir Henry Greer of the National Stud, he, like so many, had lost both his sons in the Great War. Sir Brian Mahan had been part of the 
general commanding forces in Ireland in the two years after 1916 and was another horse racing expert who helped to keep Irish racing alive during the troubled years. He too tried to bring warring factions together during the Civil War, for which endeavour his wife's mansion at Ballymore Eustace was burned down. <clears throat> he was an Anglican by background, but in 1937 he converted to Catholicism, by which time the old Senate was gone. Yet another colourful Southern Unionist was Brian Cooper of Marquis Castle in County Sligo, Old Etonian, war veteran, Shakespeare specialist, and man of letters, later becoming a TD as an independent. He was divorced and remarried to a divorcee, though this doesn't seem to have been held against him in this new Catholic state. Um, so if, where individuals were concerned, th th there was that, I, I, I think, and I hope, that sense of tolerance. James Goodbody, Henry Guinness, Sir Thomas Grattan, the Earls of Granard, Dunraven and Kerry, the Marquis of Hedford, and Ellen, Countess of Bessart, who was Jewish, were among the non-Catholics who entered that first Senate. Some critics, inevitably Constance Markovitz, regarded the class they represented as too British, although Dubliners had a kinder name, relics of old decency. And of course, there were glittering uh, literary editions like Oliver St. John Gogarty, Alice Stopford Green, and W.B. Yeats. Senator Yeats is remembered now for having made a, uh, a speech against the prohibition of divorce, although that was not wholeheartedly acclaimed at the time. Donald O'Sullivan, the, as clerk of the Senate, called it a deplorable speech, and William Cosgrave, effectively Taoiseach uh, avant la lettre, um, is, is responded by saying that the majority of Irish people regarded marriage as being incapable of being dissolved, which was an objectively true statement at the time. And I've seen Cosgrave and his government described today as being socially conservative, but I think we have to remember that what was socially conservative, what is socially conservative in 2021 was majority thinking really in 1921. The real power, of course, lay with the Doyle and, with, and the government then as now. And certainly the Irish government was representative of a Catholic state. And almost all, the, all who served were products of ambitious Catholic education. Ernest Blythe was the only Protestant amidst them. Cosgrave was a deeply religious man, schooled by the Christian brothers, who had his own private chapel, not the last Irish politician to have such a facility. He and his wife happily frequented St. Patrick's Purgatory at Loch Derg. His deputy, Kevin O'Higgins, who proved so dominant the enforcer of law, order and sobriety, was one of 10 children and educated by the Christian brothers and then at Clongos. Owen MacNeill, the Minister for Education, was a product of St. Malachy's College, one of five brothers, all of whom were academically brilliant. His nomination was supported by three priests. His grandson, uh, Senator Michael McDowell, I think has a different cast of mind. And perhaps that represents is simply a, sh a shift in Irish values over this hundred years. It's a feature of Irish life, though, that many Irish politicians have had sisters who were nuns. And Richard Mulcahy, later been a Gael leader, educated by the Christian brothers, had four sisters, nuns. His wife was Min Ryan, the family so wonderfully chronicled in Roy Foster's vivid faces. And she too had a sister, a nun, as well as two sisters who married President Sean T. O'Kelly, whose idea of a holiday abroad was a pilgrimage to Lourdes or perhaps better, Rome, we could also be okay. Even Michael Collins, who was prepared to shoot the Bishop of Cork, had a sister and nun. Um, sometimes the influence of Catholicism in Irish life came as much through informal connections as through Episcopal diktat. Sean McEntee, after all, 
had three priestly brothers-in-law, and Eamon de Valera's own half-brother was also a priest. The Christian brothers, the Jesuits, and other leading teaching orders and the GAA were consistent parts of the formation of the men who began to govern a new independent Ireland. Hugh Kennedy, the Attorney General, had spent time in a Jesuit seminary. Joe McGrath, uh, educated by the Christian Brothers, who would launch the sweepstakes, was a man of strong religious belief and became a papal knight. <clears throat> Patrick McGilligan, the driving force in the Shannon electrification scheme, was a man of noted faith and patriotism, one of 12 children of a Derry businessman and educated at St. Columns. Even Desmond Fitzgerald, father of Garrett, who had been to school at a London grammar, was a Catholic intellectual drawn to Thomist philosophy and European Catholic thinking. And the new civil service, too, was increasingly staffed <coughs> by Irish Catholics. When Frank Duff started the Legion of Mary, he drew much of his initial support from colleagues in the public service, and many of the men whom he uh, had to help him with the Legion of Mary ha had already been working with the St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, these were all civil, new Irish civil servants. So in the circumstances, it wasn't unexpected that Catholic values were well represented in the new Irish state. And yet many of these values were at the time shared values. Uh, the early prohibition against divorce in 1923 and the 1929 censorship law are sometimes cited as examples of almost theocratically Catholic law introduced by the state. But I think this uh, really, uh, you know, needs some nuancing. I mean, despite Yeats's objections, Irish Protestants themselves were often conservative on the subject of divorce. As Diane Urquhart notes in her study, she's an excellent uh, academic at, at Queen's University, in her study of Irish divorce, lines were drawn really not so much on religious uh, uh, um, divisions, but uh, according to whether people were liberals or conservatives. So it was more a sort of a political, really, uh, cast of mind than a religious one at that time. And there was a great deal of correspondence in the Church of Ireland Gazette at the time of the divorce bill. And many Irish Anglicans voiced their opposition to divorce, although admittedly, they wanted to express their views off their own bat um, as individuals and not be told by the Church of Rome. In the end, of course, um, as we know, Archbishop Gregg supported the state on the issue of divorce. And when the abdication crisis occurred in 1936, Irish Protestants were vehemently against the king marrying a divorced woman. Indeed, it was the Protestant nations in the Commonwealth, Canada, New Zealand, and, all, and most notably Scotland, which anathemized Mrs. Simpson as a scandal, scandalous divorcee. She wasn't actually allowed even to visit uh, her fiancé, as it were, uh, the, uh, the Prince of Wales in Scotland at the time. Even in 1956, it will be remembered, the Archbishop of Canterbury restrained Princess Margaret from marrying a divorced man. So I think it's an error to portray Irish Protestants of the 1920s uh, as, as, as if they were sort of pioneering social liberals like, like the Bloomsbury group. They, they really, uh, in the majority, they weren't. Ireland Usher wrote that the prohibition against divorce simply registered an accepted reality of the time. The censorship, as we all know, became outrageous and, and ridiculous and, and, and you know, rising to a sort of mania in the 1950s. But again in the 1920s, nearly all states practiced censorship. The new candor in literature and movies shocked those who had been born in a Victorian age. The League of Nations in 1923 agreed to take measures against evil literature 
and over 30 nations uh, signed an agreement to halt it and restrain it, including Britain, Sweden, the Netherlands, USA, France, Italy, Greece, Poland, Switzerland, Australia. And the Irish Free State was actually the last to sign the agreement against evil literature, although possibly the most ardent in implementing it. Censorship as an arm of states, even in democracy, really lasted until the dawn of the 1960s. In 1960, the famous Lady Chatterley trial began to sort of change everything and challenge the notion of censorship. And in 1966, the Vatican itself ab abolished its famous index. It's, tr it's true that the Irish Free State at its foundation was Catholic in the majority and led by men who were profoundly formed by Catholic values and education. J.J. Lee suggests that the homogeneity of the Irish state was also the source of its survival and stability. Because most people shared the same values, it was easier to, uh, uh, to steward a new state. But the, the new continental states, such as Romania and Czechoslovakia, which had large minorities, proved to be unstable and effectively collapsed. I'm not a partitionist, but it's hard to see how the unionist population in the North could have been peacefully integrated into the new Irish state, although paradoxically, they probably would have agreed about divorce and, and naughty books. Yet I think there was a sincere endeavor to demonstrate inclusivity and as evidence of this, I will turn to perhaps a more frivolous source. From the 1920s, right up to the Second World War, the Irish Independent, who were, which was the most successful national newspaper and strongly pro-Catholic, even clericalist, followed with minute and respectful details the comings and goings of the old Anglo-Irish gentry in their social and personal daily column. This activity was very evidently part of the social fabric of the nation and of history until 1940, when everything changed. Most diligently, they would report when King George and Queen Mary celebrated the King's birthday, or that the Prince of Wales subsequently Edward VIII briefly, accompanied by Lord and Lady Louis Mountbatten, had attended the Wembley exhibition, and the Prince was most impressed by the show, or that the Marquis of Hartington, elder son of the Duke and Duchess of, of Devonshire of Lismore Castle, was 29. This would have ha had resonance, by the way, with readers who would recall that a previous Lord Hartington had been a victim of the Phoenix Park murders, in 1882. And while Lord and Lady Charles Cavendish of the same ilk had just returned to London from this moor, along with Lady Eva Forbes, sister of the Earl of Granard, or that the Earl of Westmeath had just turned 59. Lord Westmeath, we were informed, was twice wounded in the European War and married Doris, daughter of the late, late Charles Imlach of of Liverpool and has issue a son and a daughter. Moreover, Lord Westmeath is descended from Sir Gilbert de Nugent, who accompanied Sir Hugh de Lacey into Ireland at the time of Henry II and the earldom dates from 1621. So they're threading uh, Irish history in between this wonderful sort of hello magazine uh, picture of what the gentry were doing. The Marquis of Dufferin and Avon was seldom overlooked, along with his wife, of course, who's the daughter of the uh, honor Honourable Ernest Guinness. And one of his sisters, indeed, is Francis Marchioness Conningham. I mean, there's reams and reams of these reports, in caref including careful tracking of members of the gentry's entrances and exits via steamboat or even seaplane. While we see Lady Mary Packenham sister of the Earl of Longford, gracefully advertising Bond's cold cream. So this, this is very much the sort of informal part of what we might describe as the inclusivity of Irish social life. 
a most respectful annual notice appeared celebrating the birthday of the seventh Duke of Leinster, who it was unfailingly noticed with the premier Duke, Marquis and Earl of Ireland. He was formerly in the Irish Guards and was wounded during the Great War, twice married and his only child, the Marquis of Kildare, is married to the eldest daughter of Major and Mrs. McMurrah Kavanagh of Boris House, County Carlo, and thus a descendant of Dermot McMurrah. Wonderful history note there. His Grace the Duke married four times in all and died by his own hand in 1976 in a bedsitter in Paddington, London, where he had been living on social security. The decline from great wealth and position to a sad finale may have symbolized for some the fall of a dynasty or even a class. Leinster House, built by his forebear, the first Duke, in 1745 as the finest nobleman's mansion in Dublin, now houses the Doyle and Senate and Shannad of the Republic of Ireland. And whatever democratic virtues of our Oroccus may be, I'd suggest that Shannad Aaron today is somewhat less colourful, less glamorous, and possibly less interesting than the first Senate of the Irish Free State. Mary, thank you. Um, that was uh, quite a, a tour d'horizon of the, the Free State. So, so the central point, I mean, I come back to the major questions about whether Limerick was ever um, uh, the the uh, the beau ideal of bourgeois manners, uh, or indeed whether the, the 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 fall from Leinster House to a Paddington bedsitter is has its equal in any other life story. But your central case is therefore that the Free State in its in its social conservatism was 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 quite normal for the time, and the, the divergence in Irish social norms comes later relative to other European countries. Is that the, the, the sort of the, well, I, the, I, mean, of the I, I think that is a kind of uh, sort of hinterland, really. Um, as Ireland, as the Free State progressed, it did become more Catholic, actually. But uh, it was more diverse, it seems to me. I mean, the, um, they, they were still singing God Save the King, after all, in, in, at TCD in the 1930s because uh, Owen Sheehy Skeffington used to regularly uh, protest against it and, 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 sit, and sit down through this anthem. Um, but I think after 1940, things changed. Uh, I mean, J.H. White, in his magisterial Church and State of Modern Ireland, makes that point that the notion of a strong sort of Catholic Ireland really only, really only got kind of crystallised you know, in the 1940s and 50s, when you had I, I, uh, the effect of neutrality in the 1940s was a sort of insulating, had an insulating effect, uh, it seems to me. And Ireland uh, was also very much left out in the cold because of her neutrality. I mean, neutrality was completely supported uh, democratically, but uh, we, we know that Ireland wasn't admitted to the United Nations as a sort of punishment, really. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't part, it decided not to be part of NATO as well. So Ireland was a, a poor country in a, in a cold world, really, after, after the Second World War. And the, the population was decreasing. And it was quite, I, I, I think that, it, I think it seemed to a lot of people that the the, 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 the Catholic Church was the only big player that they had on their side, as it were. I mean, I, I think that small countries always need big friends, whether that's the British Empire or the European Union. Um, and so I think that was part of it. But I also, but there were a lot of different factors playing into the increasing sense of a Catholic state after the Second World War, not least of which I think was the ascent of them. Um, uh, John Charles McQuaid as Archbishop of Dublin, who was uh, a, a very domineering uh, and in some ways very, uh, very clever and able and extremely controlling uh, personality who was able to exercise his, his influence over 
uh, the, the state, in effect. A couple of questions from, from Paul Nugent. One about the, the Lorcan Sir uh, quote, when the, when the British moved out, the church moved in. Uh, can, you, can you tell us more about where that was written? But he actually said that in, a, in, a, in a, an off-the-cuff remark with Miriam O'Callaghan on RTE. And as I didn't exactly have the date, I emailed Lorcan Sir to ask him uh, had he, you know, to confirm he'd said this, and he sent me an email saying yes, he had said it. So um, the reference is uh, uh, in the public sphere. It's in a conversation with uh, Miriam O'Callaghan, and I think 2019, but it's certainly on my email system as well. And, and Paul makes us ask the other question, which I guess we have, we have Roy Foster in the audience too, who may have supplementary comments, but what happened to those individuals who had been in that, that radical generation, that pre-revolutionary generation that, that created the, the intellectual and social context for it? Where did they go, I mean, in your, in your reading, in that period of the free state? Well, I, I suppose, I mean, first of all, they grew older. And of course, uh, the, um, when the, the, the field of oil came to power in 1932, one of the points about the people associated with De Valera was that they had been strong Republicans. Many of them had actually been excommunicated by the Catholic Church you know, in the 1920s. They were getting middle-aged. They were men of, uh, you know, married men with children and so on. And uh, they were keen, I think, in some cases to show that they were now uh, compensating, if you like, for their excommunicating days. Um, and de Valera himself, of course, was a very, very devout Catholic. Lord Longford, Frank Longford, told me that he that de Valera was the most religious man he'd actually ever met in his life. Um, so, I mean, that was a, also a powerful influence. Although de Valera, uh, or he was religious, but he wasn't always sectarian. I think that has to be said. And he did try not to be sectarian. Um, and in the case of the famous case of the, the, the Protestant librarian in the west of Ireland. He insisted on, um, you know, dialing that down. Uh, so I, th I think there was a number of things and younger people emigrated and, um, uh, and the church and uh, Catholic education were very, very effective agencies. They were, I mean, uh, again, Joe Lee says this, they pro provided the clever young people who were running the country, really. Um, and, you know, they'd educated these big people very well. But there was the, uh, you know, there was the uh, obvious aging process. And there was the fact that the world was cha changed as well uh, throughout the 1930s, the 40s and 50s. Roy, can, can it would be interesting to hear your, your sense of that in that period, what what was happening to those individuals as you read it? Well, I tried to look at this a little in my um, in the epilogue to my book. I mean, many of them were women, and they were sort of absorbed back into private life in the 1920s. I was interested to hear Mary mention Min, the wonderful Min Ryan, in whose name a uh, park has just been opened in Wexford, the Min Ryan Park. But she, um, her, her children, one of whom is a friend of mine, said that they grew up not really knowing how active a revolutionary she'd been. They knew all about their father, of course, Richard Mulcahy, but she had just sort of buttoned down that part of her life. And this was a woman who, you know, went to see Sean McDermott in his cell the night before he was executed and who had carried messages before 1916 and was from a profoundly Republican family. Um, others, and here I'd probably, this is slightly against the, 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 the drift of Mary's, paper. Um, others who were Protestants felt sidelined because they were Protestants. I think that's true of Bulmer Hobson, who was at the centre of the revolutionary generation and was very much sidelined into a kind of office job in the Free State. And though he used to say what fun they all had when they were young, he, he sort of is, is, is marginalised. Alice Milligan goes back and lives unwillingly in Northern Ireland with her relations. Many people felt there wasn't a, a place for them in the Free State because their ideas, Hannah Shee, Skeffington, constant critic, Rosamond Jacob, another, um, they, they felt that the revolution that had happened wasn't their revolution. I think 
that's an interesting aspect. I absolutely agree with Mary's point about inclusivity in the Free State, which I think was very much part, certainly, of the Cumannagel agenda. And I think they should be given all credit for that. But at the same time, there were those for whom inclusivity wasn't really offered. And I think you can apply that to a whole swathe of intellectuals as well, like Sean O'Casey, Samuel Beckett, and of course, James Joyce. And some prefiguration there of things that you will be talking to us uh, about about tomorrow, Roy, for which thank you. Uh, Onyani Hanel uh, asks a, a very interesting question, Mary, whether given the makeup of the Irish society that you're, you're describing in the free state period, whether you agree with the conclusions of the, the Commission on the Mother and, and, uh, and Baby Home System, that, that its failings, which have become so painfully apparent, uh, are really the responsibility of society as a whole. What, how, would you, how would you respond to that? Well, this commission is 3,000 pages long. And I haven't been able to download it. It's, it's it's very difficult to actually access the original um, document. Um, but of course, I've read all the commentaries uh, that have come out, and um, I, I think it, the overall. I mean, my own. I grew up in Ireland in the nineteen fifties, and my uh, of course I had um, a very strong impression of the obsession with respectability. It was a very, very, very strong driving force, that notion of respectability. Um, uh, and, and it governed a great deal. And again, it wasn't, these, these notions were not, um, were not confined to Ireland. Uh, Jane Robinson, a British uh, so, so, social history, historian, has written a terrific book called um, in the family way, in which she describes attitudes, for example, to illegitimacy and to unmarried mothers in Britain um, from the Great War up to 1975. And it, you know, they were terribly cruel attitudes. And there are something like 250,000 British women uh, who say today, who say that they were forced to place their children for adoption um, over the last 50 years. So that is a situation, the, the actual situation of the stigmatizing of illegitimacy and the uh, the harsh treatment of unmarried, unwed mothers uh, is uh, occurred in many societies. But it, it seemed perhaps it was more extreme in Ireland. Perhaps the institutions to which they were um, to which they were condemned, as it were, very often by their own families. Uh, were worse than 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 they were in other countries, but certainly the the context was it, there were many shared problems with other societies. There's a wonderful novel actually by Margaret Drabble, written in 1965, called The Millstone, about a young cl a clever young woman um, who is pregnant outside of marriage, and really gives a wonderful insight into even very enlightened people. Um, and they're very, very negative attitudes. So I, I do think that all these things have to be explored to, and, and the truth found. But I think we must look at the context uh, of other societies. Ireland wasn't alone in some of the assumptions that were made, but there was, there was this huge emphasis on, on respectability, uh, which I think was in some ways very deleterious for society. Does that address the question, Anya? Hey. <laughs> quite, quite well, thank you, Mary. By the way, uh, the document is is actually, unless anything has changed, easily accessible. <laughs> anyway, well, I was told that it was very hard to download the three thousand pages. Or two thousand words. <laughs> Well, I wasn't suggesting that, but one can it, it, one can dip into the, the various sec okay. sections. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, economist. Yes, um, Paul had had another question, less about the the social impact than the economic impact. Do you think Catholicism 
uh, retarded the the economic growth of the the state. Well, I, I certainly think that um, De Valera's uh, uh, economic ideas did retard the growth of the state um, because somebody like uh, Sean Lamas, who who actually probably uh, uh, unlike many of his peers, it's been suggested Sean Lamas was not really a believer, by the way, or that he was a little bit agnostic. Um, uh, uh, but he certainly, from the 1930s onwards, Lamas was really keen on, uh, you know, very progressive policies, including uh, the development of aviation, which he was really, really supportive of, which was very important, I think, for an Irish, for the economy. And a, a lot of the men who were involved in state um, uh, in the development of uh, semi-state industries in, and within the IDA, men like Michael Killeen and indeed T.K. Whitaker were actually, they were had very progressive economic ideas, but they were actually, Whitaker particularly was a, quite a devout Catholic. Um, so that I, uh, so I, and I think that it's uh, probably a little bit patchy. Um, certainly, uh, um, I, though there, there is a, a strain in Catholicism, which uh, it's got, it's more or less disappeared, uh, but which had um, a sort of tremendous, uh, tremendously admiring attitude. Uh, admiring isn't perhaps the word, but it had a kind of holy attitude to poverty, and that poverty was um, something which was uh, uh, um, laudable. Uh, 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 and that the poor were were not they were not corrupted by the by the materialism of the world. That is a strain which certainly appears in um, uh, in the missionary magazines and in the devotional magazines. But I think it was sort of patchy, really, uh, um, uh, because th there were individual Catholics who were certainly had progressive economic ideas but of course uh, there were others who who had not and 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 followed de, de valera's very very um uh, uh, sort of um narrow-minded uh, uh, uh ideas of, of i mean de valera thought debt was something terrible he didn't embrace you know the the keynesian ideas that you could uh, that you could actually uh, build from debt. And, and going back to the earlier period, and that in some ways the uh, ecclesiastical foundations of the, the, the pre-free state era, Fanola Finley of, of uh, Roaring Water Journal fame and a, and a great supporter of our festival has been reading, she says, speeches by bishops at dedication ceremonies of new churches before 1920, and is kind of struck by how they equate um, uh, nationalism and 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 the, the nationalist cause with 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 Catholicism. Does that suggest to you that there was you know there was a attitudes were were fixed in that way before the foundation of the Free State? And, and given the the Catholic Church's rather um, fraught relationship with advanced nationalism with with republicanism, is, it, is there a slightly a, a, a a, a well, I, mean, I, think, I think bishops were always in favour of building churches, and, and <laughs> they certainly were. I, I'm disappointed um, that Finola finds I'm disappointed that that, that they ha were nakedly sectarian. I mean, one of the things that what once started to happen when the IRA began to uh, um, uh, target uh, so uh, Southern Unionists uh, in, uh, in the you know, men, men like Alan Bell and so on, who were uh, judges and, and magistrates. The bishops condemned this very strongly, and they 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 were um, uh, you know very in that sense. They, I won't say they were ecumenical, but they certainly thought it was appalling to target uh, Anglicans because they were part of uh, the, the British state apparatus, if you like. And I suppose the bishops themselves were varied on the whole question of nationalism. I mean, he, I think Cardinal Logue was considered to be rather a mild home, home ruler, whereas Bishop Fogarty was uh, quite a strong nationalist. So I think they, they, they had their own point of view. 
Um, but I suppose what it, what is very fascinating when I examined the uh, devotional magazines was the very, very subtle way that uh, the ecclesiastical uh, attitudes changed swiftly, not very, very carefully uh, between uh, between 1916 and, uh, and, and coming up to 1921. Because in the early years, as we know, the, the, the church condemned the rising and, uh, and all that went with it, with it um, because of St. Paul's view that you must accept the proper authority. That was very much part of the sort of theological argument. But little by little, they can, you know, they can see the way the market is changing. The big change really, I think, comes with the um, uh, campaign against conscription in 1918. And that was actually a deeply religious campaign as well as a political one. They, they started to do a lot of novenas and rosaries and uh, uh, church services of all kinds against conscription. And it was at this point, I think, that the change began towards uh, a more affirmative nationalism. And of course, by the time we get to the new state, the church is pretty firmly behind the new state, although there are always some Republican priests. Um, uh, Ernie O'Malley writes very, very lyrically, actually, in, in, in his memoirs, and not just um, Another Man's Wound, but also The Singing Flame, when he talks about priests who would minister to the Republicans who were uh, who were formerly excommunicated, and they did look for their own pastors, as it were. So I suspect it was it was um, it was. Uh, uh, I think where sectarianism arose, reading the Catholic press um, before the First World War, was this sort of uh, you know uh, complaints about jobs, and there were there was quite a lot of material saying that you know the Freemasons. Um, you know, had, you know, sewn up all the Dublin jobs and, and Catholics didn't get a look in. Um, that was probably exaggerated, but I think there were, the, 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 there was an area of the civil service. I mean, you know, Halpin makes a reference to that, that Walter Long s said about the civil service in Ireland, be sure to hire strong unionists, you know, don't, don't hire rebels. So I think there was an area of conflict there where, you know, the, this rising Catholic uh, middle class wanted more of the jobs. And I imagine that did lead to little undercurrent of sectarianism in a way. And yet um, there was this other thing which I must refer to in my own background. I grew up in Sandy Mount in, in Dublin and uh, it was very uh, much a Protestant and Catholics lived cheek by jowl, very, very harmoniously, but there was a, an acceptance, if you like, a, to some degree of separate spheres in a way, and that we, we did kind of, I think there was a sort of social acceptance that more Catholics worked for the civil service and the state, and that more Protestants worked in uh, the sort of mercantile area, if you like, and that, you know, the, the big... Well, the, 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 sorry, I'm going on too long. Anyway, I hope that... It, to some degree, addresses what Finola was saying. Thank you. I mean, a question back on the on the on the, the, the first Senate, the Free State Senate you described from Brendan Fennerty. I mean, was was that a conscious emulation or, or replication of an inclusive model from somewhere else? Where were they? Where were they getting the ideas behind that structure? Yeah, I really honestly don't know, but I suppose bicameralism was. It was an accepted um, model, and I and I, I think that it is a sort of mixture, really. Of I think there was a lot of the, the the free staters wanted to sort of maybe make amends to some of these senators, these old gentry who whose houses had been burned down. I think that was quite a a strong feature, really, and um, and also. Probably to, to to encourage them not to leave the country, um, and uh, of course it was uh, uh, a senate was it was partly partly appointed and partly voted, but it's, it, a senate is only a, a a reviewing chamber, so it doesn't have the power. But but I I, I 
I can't answer whether it was based on other on other models, but um, I do think it was a uh, it was an interesting and and uh, attempt to try to be inclusive um, and help the southern unionists to some extent. And, because some of them did feel I, there was one of, group of Southern Unionists who said that you know after partition they had been thrown to the wolves, um, uh, and and I think that people the those who were uh, ruling the new Irish state wanted to follow both both Arthur Griffith and o, Kevin O'Higgins did make speeches specifically saying. These people are our people too, and they are part of our country. So I think that there, there was a genuine aspiration there. Could I come in there, Simon? I think that drafts for the old Home Rule Parliaments that never came to be included weighted representation for Protestant minorities in an upper house. I'm pretty sure that's the case, certainly in the 1912 Home Rule Bill as drafted. So in a way, they're carrying on a bit of the Home Rule tradition there, which is interesting in some ways. Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much for, you know, for that. Um, I mean, I'd, 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 I'd like to come back to this question. It, it's an interesting question. I'm, I feel sure feminists will develop it more about why so many of the women who'd been involved, you know, in the Irish Revolution weren't really part of the Irish state. Oh, they didn't, you know, they didn't progress. They didn't get appointed. I mean, partly it may have been, there may have been a sort of, patriarchy, uh, almost certainly there was an attitude of patriarchy. Um, but quite a lot of writers, people like Terence Devere White, for example, do think that many of these women were very extremist. Uh, and they did have a reputation for being extremist. Um, I mean, Hannah Sheehy Skef Skeffington was an admirable woman, but she was secretary of the Irish Friends of the Soviet Union which probably didn't <laughs> endear her to uh, either Protestant or Catholic bishops at the time. <laughs> um, and uh, Maud Gone was, of course, a, an, an astonishing woman and a great legend. But again, uh, you know, they were, they did take very hardline views uh, and a very hardline stance at the time of the treaty. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you had people like Jenny Wise Power who did uh, come into the into the free state. But um, why, Roy, do you think that so many of these women were seen as extremists? Well, they were quite extreme, but so were many people. I think there's a restabilization of ideology after the First World War and in the 20s. You know, it's seen by some as a kind of golden moment for socialism and radicalism the years up to the First World War. M much has been written about this, and these people were, were of that generation. Um, but I think you can't leave out factors like the marriage bar and the civil service and other things. You know, it, it was to be a, a woman actively engaged in building the new state in the 1920s wasn't very easy. Mm. Teachers and nuns built it, but as women, but uh, um, you don't get senior women civil servants to tackle beer, I suppose. Yeah. I think you'd probably agree with that, Mary. Yes, well, I would, uh, except I think there was a marriage bar in other societies too, because um, it, it, it was the factor of the, the, sec the Second World War liberated women because it removed the marriage bar. In England, for example, because they needed school teachers, they removed the marriage bar at that point during the Second World War. Um, uh, so that they could have teachers. Uh, and of course, Ireland suffered from not having that opportunity, perhaps. Yeah. Well, Mary, I, thank you. You have covered a, a lot of ground. You've prompted lots of questions. Um, 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 and we're in, in your debt. It's very interesting. I mean, a, a number of the people that you referred to as the... Uh, or well, you don't refer to them as this, but uh, the, the the Dubliners that you mentioned refer to as the the relics of our decency will will appear in other parts of uh, the festival program. Curiously, the burning of Horace Plunkett's house is something to which Donald Lowry refers in the the, the talk he's given. Uh, and at our first the first um, festival, a portrait um, of of 
Cooper uh, hung uh, amongst a, a group that we had selected of interesting Irish figures from the revolutionary period behind one of the speakers. So perhaps we can get a photograph of that and have it sent to you. Um, but uh, for now, thank you um, all the way from, from Deal, um, uh, where I suspect your weather by the looks of it is, is as good as it is in West Cork. But, but thank you for, from all of us. And we hope we will see and hear more from you over the course of, of the weekend. Thank you very much, Simon. It's been an honour, and, and and thank you for everybody. For, thank you to everybody who made such interesting points. Thank you very much. Uh, and just as a reminder, for those of you who have interest in the the live events uh, over the rest of the weekend, it's still possible to uh, to register for those via the website. And we hope to see uh, all of you and more over the uh, over the course of Saturday and Sunday. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you.